Fairly. And also, of course, a very warm welcome from my side. Um, I'm happy that despite the pandemic and all this online working, we still can meet and talk to each other. Um, the first session uh, is on Jewish social mobility, economy and diamonds. And our first speaker is Sitzke van der Veen. She studied history at the University of Amsterdam. She's a PhD candidate at the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands also known as Huygens ING. Her doctoral research is about the social mobility and integration of what she calls Jewish Dutch with a higher social status from 1880 till 1940. And her project is part of a bigger project, which is entitled in Dutch, Tegen de Stroom in de Sociale Mobiliteit van Joodse Nederlanders in, in English, Against the Grain, Social Mobility of uh, Jewish Dutch. So, Sitzka, I, I, someone is still has to mute the microphone, I guess, but the floor is yours. Thank you, Karin. I will share my screen. Oh, um, so there we go. You can see my, my screen, hopefully. Um, okay. Let me, yes. Um, so luckily Karin already introduced me elaborately, so I will quickly go on to, to my presentation. Um, my PhD project is indeed about the um, social mobility and integration of the Jewish Dutch elite. Um, but today I would like to share with you uh, some of my findings for an article um, which I'm writing for Historica, Dutch language um, journal on gender history. Um, uh, about possible explanations for the overrepresentation of Jewish women in the women's movement, which has been referred to um, by historians uh, of Jewish as well as, as gender history. Uh, I sincerely welcome all of your questions and feedback, and um, I'm sure they will support me in um, submitting the best possible first version of this article. Um, so although no one has previously taken the overrepresentation of Jewish women in the women's movement as sole point of departure for a study, possible explanations have been given. Um, and naturally the reasons for, um, for becoming active in the women's movement uh, differed from person to person. And for some well-known Jewish feminists, uh, these reasons have been uh, well described in a biography. Uh, furthermore, the literature suggests that uh, most Jewish feminists came from an upper class or an upper middle class background. Uh, and then Miriam Eberhardt has suggested that because of the fact most of them lived a um, fairly secular life, uh, liberal Jewish women such as uh, Rosa Manus um, were less constrained in their thoughts and actions uh, and therefore inclined to support feminism. For Aleta Jacobs, of course, it has been suggested that because of her secular worldview, she was able to cultivate um, a more radical stand on certain issues such as birth control. Uh, moreover, uh, Miriam Everhart and Marlous Schoenheim for bourgeois feminists, but also um, Selma Leidesdorf and Karin Hofmeister for Jewish women in the forefront of the, of the labor movement, uh, have spoken of, of a certain Jewish tradition of emancipation struggle in which these women followed. And for women in the, in the forefront of the labor movement, such as um, Roche Voss, for example, or Alida de Jung, an individual ambition um, for upward social mobility um, perhaps also played a part in their activism. And perhaps this road to modernity, the labor movement formed, as described by Karen Hofmeister and Selma Leidesdorf, also applied to feminism. And lastly, um, Selma Leidesdorf, has, and among others, has spoken of feminism as a bridge to try to traverse uh, into the Gentile world um, as a possible path to, to integration into, into Dutch society. And perhaps at the heart of all of this um, lies the so-called double burden of these women, uh, unable to fully belong in the world of men, um, as well as the world of, of non-Jews. Uh, so in most publications on, on pre-war um, uh, Jewish feminists, um, the focus lies on one or a few well-known uh, individuals, but I looked at uh, 24 Jewish feminists who all hold entries in, the, um, in one or more digitized uh, biographical dictionaries in the Dutch biography portal. 
Uh, my sample includes, of course, the well-known women who I mentioned before, um, but also women who were active, for example, in the Dutch National Council of Jewish Women, which was established in the 1920s, and women um, who deserved a place in Bioport for other reasons than their feminism, but who were feminists nonetheless. Uh, and when relevant and where possible, um, I compared the Jewish feminists uh, with the total of 117 Jewish women uh, who are in my database. Uh, and of course, all biographical dictionaries in Bioport um, are biased to some degree, uh, which is why I use primary sources to fill in the gaps. Um, but luckily, all 24 Jewish feminists uh, have a biography in the online dictionary of Dutch women, uh, which is a fairly recently established uh, biographical dictionary with high demands for the authors uh, and their sources, which makes it quite uh, reliable. And I use the online tool uh, for humanities scholars, no goat, uh, to filter um, and visualize my data. Uh, and first I wanted to share with you these averages, average percentages for the period between 1870 and 1940. I think they're quite interesting as they seem to suggest Jewish women in general, um, but Jewish feminists in particular, uh, were more often unmarried and childless than their gentle counterparts. However, um, of course, Bioport has a bias for, uh, for working women, and they in this period were, of course, more often um, unmarried. So we, we have to keep that in mind. Um, and then over to social mobility, um, the Jewish feminists in Bioport certainly grabbed the chances that changing times gave them as women and as Jews. Um, of course, they became members of, of a lot of feminist organizations, but uh, they also had considerably high um, education levels. 83% uh, received some form of high school education. Um, on the total of 117 women, uh, this was 66%, uh, and 29% went to university. Uh, the total was 25. So, so that these are um, are quite uh, considerable percentages. Again. I have to remind you uh, of the bias in Bioport, of course, uh, for working women. Um, and when these women went to university, they studied traditional, uh, uh, just traditional studies like law or medicine, but also uh, studies in the humanities. And of course, um, as has been described in the literature, uh, the labor movement uh, feminists experienced major upward social mobility, um, ended up in national politics, uh, but the other women had, had good jobs as well. Um, but most women, as the literature has suggested, indeed um, grew up in upper middle class feminists. Uh, with, I think, the important distinction here that they either grew up within a haute bourgeois uh, Jewish milieu or were daughters of slightly more new members of the upper classes. And some women, uh, like Rosa Manus, uh, that has been described in her biography, but also Emmy Bellinfante, uh, they descended from 19th century uh, emancipationists who had fought for political emancipation of the Jews in the beginning of the 19th century. And quite a few more women actually had living uh, family members who strived for the emancipation and rights of Jews, um, of the working class, or indeed of women. Uh, and they possibly inspired or, or stimulated uh, these women to fight for a cause as well. And on the topic of secularism, of course, I, I researched a quite a diverse group and uh, the relationship between Judaism and um, feminism uh, is not necessarily negative here. Um, consciously Jewish women, um, this included religious Orthodox women, but also uh, Zionists um, were mostly moderate feminists and they became active in the Council of Jewish Women uh, and related organizations, or for example, uh, the Women's International uh, Zionist Organization. Uh, most women, however, um, who were still brought up in the Jewish faith um, to some degree distanced themselves um, from their religion at a later age. Uh, with most indeed living a fairly secular life, like Aleta Jacobs in the picture. Um, and lastly, uh, with regard to integration, of course, it's hard to say if Jewish women used, so to say, the feminist movement um, to for their integration into Dutch society. Um, and if they did, if this was a conscious process, 
Um, but these 24 women were integrated, um, highly integrated. They married Gentiles, and although most of them lived in Amsterdam at some point in their lives, a lot of them lived outside of the old Jewish quarter, um, and some settled in, in very Gentile surroundings, uh, like at Gooi. And of course, they worked together um, with, with a lot of non-Jewish women in, in, the, in the general women's movement. Uh, and thus, it seems the women's movement indeed constituted some sort of bridge uh, into the Gentile world. Although, all in all, I think um, their education, their jobs, their places of residence and their marriages uh, formed such bridges um, just as well. And finally, that these women were integrated into Dutch society in many respects um, did not mean that they left uh, the Jewish community as such or the Jewish world. Um, they still also married Jews, had Jewish friends, of course, family, um, and not unimportantly, um, some still supported Jewish social causes. And I think that was my time. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sitka. Um, unless somebody has a brief informative question, we move over to the next presentation because we will have the questions and answers at the end of this session. Um, then I would like to introduce the next speaker to you, Joris Kok. Joris Kok studied economics at Erasmus University in Rotterdam and economic history at Lund University in Sweden. Um, he is a PhD candidate at the International Institute of Social History. So um, he's one of my PhD students and he works at my institute, which I'm rather proud. Um, his research is about the social mobility of Jewish diamond workers. Um, and he is part of the same project as Sitzke's project is in. Yours, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, can, can you see the, the screen that I'm sharing now? Great. All right, well, I had a little bit of an introduction planned, but I, I don't think it's necessary anymore. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm yours, uh, second year PhD candidate at the International Institute of Social History. And uh, today I would like to present to you some uh, preliminary results uh, from some research that I'm doing now for my uh, dissertation. Um, as Kanan said, this is part of a larger project um, where we study the social mobility of uh, the the Jewish Dutch in pre-war Netherlands um, in, in two, two kind of case studies. The first being the Jewish elite that we just heard Sitzke talk about and then me talking about the, the Jewish diamond workers. And to do this, I make use of the, uh, the general Dutch diamond workers union data, that is the ANDB. Uh, and for them, we, we pull a, a subset of life courses where we try to reconstruct their entire lives. Um, and, and using those, those life courses, I am to study uh, social mobility over uh, over generations, but also over one's own lifetime, uh, regarding also uh, someone's marriage and uh, their choice of residence. Um, so, of course, I, I think for this audience, I don't have to give a, a wide background about the, the Jews of Amsterdam. Uh, the Jews before World War II were, of course, a, a significant minority group in the Netherlands. Across the in the whole country, they were roughly two percent of the population, but in Amsterdam, they constituted ten percent. Um, they 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 got their in emancipation in 1796, uh, but it wouldn't uh, be until the second half of the 19th century before we see uh, real um, breakthroughs in um, integration and, and the economic position. Um, and so far, there has been relatively limited uh, quantitative evidence. Uh, regarding their integration and social mobility, as well as how these two factors interact. And that brings us to my current study, um, where I observe a, a relatively homogenous group of Jews. Uh, that is, I look at uh, the Jewish apprentices that were trained in the diamond industry in the first half of the 20th century. I compare between them the occupations that they held in 1941. So of course, they did not have to continue uh, their work as a diamond worker at this point. They could be doing anything they wanted. Um, and I want to see to what extent we can, uh, we can understand their, their occupations that they held in that year through their, um, their social background and the level of integration that they held. 
And when I say integration, I look here at three specific measures. I look at whether you disaffiliated from a synagogue, which was a relatively uncommon thing to do. Uh, by 1941, only 10% of Jews had done so. Uh, whether you intermarried with a, a non-Jewish partner and whether you chose to live outside one of the, the Jewish centers that existed in Amsterdam. So very briefly, why would you want to study diamond workers? Well, uh, this, this group of occupation uh, was almost exclusively Jewish in the 19th century. It was one of the few occupations that uh, Jews were not actively discriminated against you know, even before their emancipation. Um, and so uh, the Jews had a very dominant position in this industry. This industry expanded rapidly uh, since 1870 when uh, abundant diamond sources were found in um, in South Africa. And um, this led to uh, a large increase in the number of workers in this industry. So between 1870 and 1890, um, the number of workers increases from 1500 to 10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and roughly 70% of these workers are Jewish. So they remain a very important factor for this industry. They also have a very strong union. Uh, almost everyone in this industry is, uh, is unionized. Uh, and this union, um, it improves the, the working conditions of these of their members uh, greatly. For example, in this image, they, they, it shows the, uh, the celebration for the uh, eight hour working day, which they were the first to accomplish in Europe uh, in 1911. However, uh, not everything went well. After 1920, the industry uh, experiences a rapid decline. Um, it was until then the largest diamond industry in the world, uh, but because of low wage competition, particularly from Antwerp, uh, more than half of the diamond workers were forced to find a new occupation because of unemployment. And that brings me to my question, what do they do uh, when I find them in 1941? And uh, to what extent can we explain this? So to study this, I make use of two sources. The first being the A and the B administration data. Uh, like I said, it, the union had more or less unionized everyone. Um, so this covers pretty much all apprentices uh, of the diamond industry at that time. Uh, during this time from 1904 to 1940, there's about 7,500 individuals that are trained um, and 70% of them are Jewish. Um, then I make also, I also make use of the, the a German registration list uh, for um, the, the, the German occupiers at the time required every, every municipality to record the inhabitants uh, in that region. And so I make use of the Amsterdam list, which uh, provides us with information on the, the residence, occupation, and religious affiliation of all Jews that lived in Amsterdam at that time. And what I do is based on their names and birth dates and uh, birthplace, I link them uh, to see uh, which apprentices I could find in 1941. Uh, I managed to link more than 2000 individuals, which is half of all Jewish apprentices in my data. Um, and then when limiting it to working men of certain ages, I'm left with 1600 individuals for which I have information on their occupation and religious affiliation. So then using some statistical approach that I'm not going to delve into too much, I want to study the relationship between the social background and the integration uh, with what kind of occupation you held. And I do this in two ways. I, I look at first, what is the social class or the social status that we can attribute to the occupation that you have. Um, and so I do this uh, in a scale of one to 12 classes and a score that goes from zero to 100 where 100 is the highest occupation. And I also want to look at what kind of industry you work in. So do you still work as a diamond worker or did you shift to another industry? So first, let me show some results for these social classes. Um, for the, the first thing we see is that this yellow or orange uh, bar, which uh, represents the medium skilled workers is the largest. So of course, these uh, diamond workers that were considered medium skilled workers in this, uh, in this class stratification, uh, most of them um, or many of them still work as a diamond worker and therefore are medium skilled workers. But we also see a very large group that are considered lower professionals, clerical and sales personnel. So more than 30% of these people that were initially trained as diamond workers ended up in, in office work or as some kind of trading position. Um, on the other hand, we also see that about 17% were, 
moves down to lower or unskilled work. So here you can imagine that people started uh, working as peddlers or as day laborers. When we want to graph these uh, occupations by the score that they had that I mentioned from zero to 100, we get this figure. And, and then once again, it's clear that 40% of these, uh, uh, these former apprentices still worked in the diamond industry. About 25% moved down. Most of them started working as clerks in warehouses, as tailors or as peddlers, but also 35% moved up. And these are the people that started working in offices or as commercial travelers or learned some other skills as an accountant. We also see that a very select few are able to make it very far and they are considered upper managers. So here you can imagine someone that's a manager in a large firm or even a factory owner. So I, I, I run a regression and I only want to show here the relationship that I find between integration and um, social status. And here we find that these individuals that I mentioned that are more integrated with their religion, their marriage, or living outside of one of these Jewish enclaves, we find that on average, they tend to have a higher social status and a higher social class, right? So for example, these individuals that work as, um, as office workers are considered a, a higher position here. And we can also do the same re uh, regression analysis for um, the type of industry that you worked in. And then we find that um, individuals that were more integrated, for example, those that explicitly stated to not be affiliated to a synagogue, they were more likely to work in the service uh, sector and less likely to work in trade. And for intermarriage in uh, the Jewish enclaves, we also see that more integrated individuals were less likely to continue working in the diamond industry. So to conclude, we see that although many of them are still diamond workers in 1941, we also see many new occupations, uh, particularly office workers, warehouse clerks, and commercial travelers. And the rest could mostly be classified as petty traders and tailors or cigar makers, but rather traditional Jewish occupations. In terms of the integration and how it relates to status, we find that those that were more integrated had a higher class on average and were more likely to work in less traditional industries uh, and more likely to work in more modern industries like office work. In the future, uh, I, I want to add to this by uh, two ways. So the life course that I mentioned, I want to really dig into what is the timing of these events of your marriage? How does that influence uh, your occupation as well as uh, when you choose to move? As well as uh, I want to link this with uh, also the membership cards to take into account uh, how often you were unemployed, for example. Um, well, that was my presentation. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Joris. Um, we stay with the diamonds and we go to the last speaker of this session, uh, Donald Weber. Um, Donald Weber is a historian. Um, since 2015, he is the research director of AMSAP Institute of Social History. Um, he wrote his PhD on uh, uh, the automobile and the government in Belgium. But his latest chapter is on trains. So he moved from cars to trains and in between he does a lot of other things for the AMSAP. And sometimes we are in uh, cooperative projects and um, which are very nice to, uh, to do. So Donald, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, let me try and share my screen. Uh, try to make this full screen. All right, I hope everybody can see this. Um, so um, this is a bit different from the other speakers um, because um, we started from a, a project that lasted for two years, and ended last year. It's called The World of Diamond. It was about diamond workers in the Netherlands, Belgium and France. But basically this was a project about cultural heritage and not so much research. So for instance, what they tried to do was create a guide that brought together all the dispersed archives and heritage funds 
of the Diamond Workers, mostly in three countries, the Netherlands, Belgium and France. We organized some crowdsourcing days where people came and were interviewed and told their life stories. And also we did uh, two, well, more technological pilot tasks. One was about handwritten text recognition, trying to uh, automatically convert uh, handwritten sources such as membership cards. And the other was about building databases of uh, biographical data and, and see and try to find out if there were technical ways of linking different data sets together. And that's the one that I want to talk about today, about our efforts to um, create and use data sets on the lives of diamond workers, which was of course prominently Jewish people, and try to see if we can learn something about their lives by linking those data together. Uh, but first, uh, before we started on this, we already had some uh, expertise on the history of diamond workers and of course of Jewish lives in those diamond industries. Um, you can see here the cover of a book already published in 1995 about the diamond workers in Belgium. And of course, um, <clears throat> cooperating with a project in the IISH, we have this beautiful book that was published by Karen. I think Karen will do a presentation um, about this uh, later on about uh, the diamond industry in the Netherlands. Let me show you what this is all about because we tend to forget that with all this technological data that it's really about people. Here you can see the people that it's all about. This is a picture of um, diamond workers in a factory in Antwerp, I think, in the 1920s. This is diamond workers at home in the, well, you can't call it the living room, in one of the rooms of their often very small houses. Another picture of diamond industry at home. You can see the children present. And uh, lastly, another picture of a diamond worker in a factory. And of course, not to forget that there were also happier moments in the lives of diamond industry workers. Um, at my institute, which is Amstel Institute, institute of Social History in Ghent in Belgium, we also have uh, collections on the International Union of Diamond Workers, which is the Allianz Universelle. Uh, you can see here uh, a screenshot from our catalog that contains uh, the archival fund of this uh, trade union. Um, and it's completely digitized, so if you go online to our catalog, you can I'll look at it just online from home. Also the newspaper or the journal that this uh, International Diamond, has, Diamond Trade Union has published, Louvrier de Monterre, is completely digitalized and consultable online. You can even do a full text search on a word and it will look for you in a digital text of this source. But let's turn to the subject of today. So what we were trying to do was build data sets on the lives of diamond workers. We did this together in cooperation with the ISH in Amsterdam because they had a very large set uh, of membership cards of the Dutch trade union. And we had uh, well a nice uh, collection of membership cards from diamond workers in Antwerp. Uh, so we tried to digitize this and put this together. Uh, first of all, we tried to create databases from these uh, paper sources. Uh, we did this through crowdsourcing. Well, mostly uh, the ISH did this. Um, we worked at Amstel with volunteers and students. Then we brought all those data sets together in um, a website, both the, the Dutch and the Belgian data sets. You can see the, the URL there. And then we tried to connect it through linked open data. And lastly, we at AMSA then took our data set and went to Kazerne du Seine and tried to link our data and to see whether we could link our data with their data set. So here you can see an image of what these membership cards are all about. You can see that it's all handwritten text. We also did a test with a technology that would automatically read out uh, these handwritten texts, but yeah, well, Text was success, the test was successful, but it turned out that it's still in its early days. So most of it was done with volunteers. This is how um, the ISH did it. It turned to a crowdsourcing platform called Vele Handen, Many Hands. Um, 
and you can see the bars are filling it in. I can't show you bars from MSAP because we did it with um, a team at our institute itself with volunteers and um, jobs and students. Um, well, we just used an access database for it. And in the end, we put it all together in this website where you can just, you know, uh, take in a search term, for instance, Levi, and it will give you lists of um, membership cards from both data sets. So for instance, you can see here, the first one is um, uh, the diamond worker from Antwerp. The second one is one from Amsterdam. So this is more or less the front end uh, of our data sets where you can work yourself in, in ser with search terms. Uh, there is also a back end and it looks a little bit more complicated. This is uh, behind the scenes, so as to say. Um, here you can see a visual visualization of uh, the triple store databases behind um, the website. And this you can use then uh, well for launching aut automated search queries and uh, take out automated lists of um, results and then yeah, try to compare it. So let's move to the results. Um, where did it get us? So we try to uh, link both data sets, both from Antwerp and Amsterdam, which is particularly um, interesting because as Joris already mentioned, uh, after the diamond industry went down in Amsterdam, uh, much of it was due to uh, lower uh, wages in Antwerp. So a lot of families, Jewish families mostly from Amsterdam moved to Antwerp. So it would be uh, actually interesting to see how both data sets contained the same persons having moved from Amsterdam to Antwerp. So um, the ISH set up a, a triple store database using Apache Druid and then we launched some uh, queries there, um, mostly thanks to a follow-up project uh, working with a grant by Rothschild. Uh, the results were actually promising. Um, variable to which criteria we were using. We had uh, a few hundreds of matches of people who are the same people in both data sets. So you could actually try and to set up a sort of life course of these people. Uh, but it, it depended very much on how strict our criteria were. You can see if we used three uh, parameters, uh, both names and the birth date, we get 350 matches. But if you then take it down to two criteria, uh, the, the matching goes up to 517 matches. So this is interesting. Um, then we try to set up uh, another test. We turn to Kazemi Dosen, who is, as we all know, who have a very nice uh, data set too of uh, the Jewish people <coughs> uh, brought to the Kazemi Dosen and then reported. Uh, this is, uh, I think, about 20,000 names in the database. Um, so uh, both our data sets at AMSAP and the data set of Docene were available in Excel format. So again, we tried to convert both data sets uh, to a triple source database. This time we were using um, a tool called Apache Fuseki. And again, we launched some uh, automated queries on these data sets. And you can see again that uh, there are actually results coming out of this. Again, uh, variable to the, the criteria that we were using. Um, the best hit we had if we only compared first name and last name, which gave us uh, matching results of 665 individuals. So um, that would be uh, interesting to follow up. Now, as you can see, we are not really trying to do research here. <clears throat> Excuse me, as we are, uh, of course, first of all, a, a collection center, a cultural heritage center, trying to provide more like a forum and tools to researchers. So what we tried to do here was to apply some recent technology to the, the information in our collections and try to use, well, modern and, and recent um, tools that are available so that if researchers want to make use of our collections, they can do so. Uh, these collections, these tools are now available. So if you're interested, then uh, please contact us. My name is Donald Weber. You can just send an email and we will try and uh, give you access to our data sets and help you out. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. And